a lecture. You know, today is a very special day. It is February 28th and it is National Science Day. It's also the foundation day for International School of Photonics, which was established in uh, February 28th, 1995. For the past uh, 26 years, uh, ISP has been conducting the annual Science Day lectures on this day. Eminent speakers used to come and give lectures uh, on National Science Day. Uh, but the past uh, two years or so, eminent speakers give the lectures, but they don't come to the campus. And this year also, I think it is the same situation. Uh, today, uh, for the National Science Day lecture, we have uh, an eminent speaker, Professor G. Ravindra Kumar of Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. Uh, um, I'll just uh, read out the CV of uh, Professor Ravindra Kumar. Uh, Professor G. Ravindra Kumar obtained his PhD in 1990 from IIT Kanpur and then uh, did their postdoctoral uh, work for some time in the institute. He has been at TIFR since 1992 and is presently a distinguished professor in the Department of Nuclear and Atomic Physics. His area of interest are experimental studies of high intensity laser pulse interaction with matter, creation and understanding of extreme states of matter and nonlinear objects. His area of study has uh, implications for many branches of physics, including plasma physics, astrophysics, condensed matter physics, and optical sciences. He has about 175 research publications to his credit. Uh, he was elected a fellow of Indian Academy of Sciences in 2004 and the Indian National Science Academy in 2008. He received a BM Birla Prize for Physi Physical Sciences in 2000, the SS Badnagar Prize for Physical Sciences in 2003, a DAE Outstanding Investigator Award in 2005, JC Bose Fellowship in 2010, and the Infosys Prize in Physical Sciences in 2015. He is a distinguished alumnus of Bits Pilani and IIT Kanpur, and he has been on the International Committee of Ultra High Intensity Lasers since 2008 and was the co chair during 2016 and 2020. He is a life member of the American Physical Society, the Plasma Society, Plasma Science Society of India, and the Indian Laser Association. He is a member of Optical Society of America. Now, today he will be speaking about. Uh, the, the effect of an huge, a huge amount of light, I will say an obscene amount of light on matter and what's going to happen. So, <laughs> Professor Dr. Indra Kumar, please. Yes. So, um, well, you can hear me and you can see me, right? And you can see my screen. Can you? Uh, is your screen the International Conference of Recent Trends? That's what we see. Yes, yes. yes. Okay, right, 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 right. So, yeah, I begin with your your own, uh, you know, uh, the brochure. Okay. Yeah. So, good morning. Thank you very much, um, uh, Pramod and Professor Girija Vallabhan. I see several other friends. Riju. I see Rishad uh, in the attendees list. So, hello to everyone. It's good to connect with old friends. And of course, what better to meet friends on the birthday of uh, the International School of Photonics? I just learned. 28th February is a great day uh, in India, certainly all over the country, but also especially for you at uh, ISP. So you've done very well in the last 26 years, and I'm sure the next 26 are going to be even bigger. And uh, as you mark these uh, events, I hope we will we'll be with you celebrating your achievements. So and thank you for having me here. You call me a Science Day speaker, so I'll try and live up to what your expectations are. Unfortunately, there's a meeting at, uh, I have to leave at 10.45 or so. Uh, so I'll try and squeeze it in, uh, whatever I have to say in uh, the next uh, 35, 40 minutes, and then we can have some interactions and then I can leave. So apologies for that. Suddenly announced on Saturday. Um, well, this is um, the story of, just one sec. Yeah. So as Professor Ilija Vallaman was saying, I stopped at uh, throwing huge amount of light at matter. In fact, uh, light matter interaction is seen in many contexts. I think you do it in a variety of ways at the ISP. 
uh, but most people are happy just using light to probe matter um, to see what's going on inside. But when you increase the amount of light that hits matter, it's no more calling, you know, throwing light on something, you know, to understand some phenomenon. It is actually throwing light at matter and making it behave in extremely unusual ways. So a bit of that, I will try and capture that, uh, capture for you in the next uh, 35, 40 minutes. And I've tailored this talk uh, essentially for the students or for the experts. I must offer, uh, take insurance by offering apologies right away. But you might know much of this stuff, but maybe uh, you'd like to listen to it once again. So um, at the bottom of the screen, you'll see uh, there's, an, uh, there's a picture, a sketch of what this talk is all about. So there's a lot of light hitting in that you know red cone that's falling on this target solid liquid whatever you have and then there is an explosion that happens there because of this huge intensity and the rest of the story is about what that explosion is what it does um, to the target and how does big energy get in how does energy get out and so on so um, well the why of this talk you know, why we do this, why throw huge amounts of light at matter is that it gives us a window, a glimpse. It opens up a little bit to look at, you know, some sort of a window to look at what is the most prevalent form of the visible universe. As you know, the most prevalent form of the visible universe is not what we experience on the earth uh, in terms of our day-to-day -day lives and interactions. Even in the labs that we do experiments, it's not the same, but it is this. The universe is essentially a very hot and dense place. It's extremely hot. Um, stellar temperatures can reach 100 million Kelvin. And the densities of the core of a star, as you know, are because of gravitational collapse, they're extremely high, right? The solid densities that you know are 10 to the 23 particles per cc, like say Avogadro number. But you can actually go 1,000 times, 10,000 times that density inside a star, inside a collapsing star. So the density coupled with temperature is a rare event on this Earth. Usually we have either high temperature or high density, but never the both, uh, both of them together. But um, as you said, you can look up to the heavens, the sun and the stars and see this. We don't really, we see manifestations of that. But if you go deep in the Earth, you have the same situation. You know that from volcanic eruptions that the core of the earth is extremely hot and molten and there are lots of things happening. If you look at the core of Jupiter, which is much heavier than the earth, you know that um, the core is probably, you know, some very strange formations of matter happen because of the high pressures. And also the temperatures there are nowhere near, I mean, not as small as uh, what we experience normally in our uh, encounter, in our day-to-day -day life but it's much, much higher. So there's also lightning that happens, uh, you know, during monsoons, particularly in Kerala, I'm sure you see lots of it. And that's also a very violent phenomenon, which is produces very high temperatures. So on the earth, we are safe, go above or below, well, you have different things. So the question now is, can you create extreme energy states on the earth in a lab? So sustain high temperature simultaneously with high density in a physical system. You take a solid, you know, its density is say one gram per cc or 10 grams per cc. And then you squeeze it so that you can increase the density by a factor of 10. Maintaining the density, can you also raise its temperature from say 300 Kelvin to 30,000 Kelvin or 100,000 Kelvin or a million Kelvin. No matter how you can do for whatever duration of time, it will be an exotic state of matter that you can actually, that mimics what you see inside a star or deep inside a planet. So this is the um, well-investigated, heavily funded area of high energy density science, where the high energy density uh, definition that is mostly accepted now is that you have, if you have an energy density in a solid of 10 to the 11 joules per meter cube, that is 100 billion joules per meter cube, that account, that is accepted as a high energy density. And that is the energy density that you find for a room temperature uh, density solid at room temperature. You know, for example, you have normal density, the so-called uh, SDP or whatever you can call it, normal densities of 10 to the 22, 10 to the 23 particles per cc. 
and temperatures of 300 Kelvin or whatever you have. And then that corresponds to this 10 to the 11 joules. So anything above this is um, called high energy density. And this corresponds to a pressure. If you're thinking of you know, holding something and squeezing it, that's about one megabar. So this is um, the high energy density science in the last 20 years has become very interesting because now you can actually do this with tabletop lasers. Like the tabletop lasers that you have at ISP, they're mostly, if you can change their shape and add some power to them in some way by adding a couple of tables, uh, you would actually be able to do this right there. And this is the thing about creating extremely excited states of matter uh, with very short femtosecond pulses of light, right? Femtosecond energetic pulses of light. And this is uh, literally approaching what you call as impulsive kick of a physical system. That is, you can start applying, thinking of applying delta functions in time on matter. And that is also known as extreme light. That is when you have very high power, uh, very short duration, ultra short duration light that has been given the name extreme light. And it's actually one frontier of the ultra fast regime. Ultra fast regime has many, many frontiers. Uh, you know, ultra fast femtosecond lasers um, can do lots of spectroscopy. They do imaging. They can also produce attosecond pulses for you going all the way down to a few 10 to the minus 18 seconds. Uh, but then usually these are all under very, very, uh, marginal power, or let's say the peak power of these pulses is very low. But in extreme light, you have these blips of light, which pack in a lot of energy simultaneously. So uh, if you pack in one joule of energy in one picosecond, as, a, as an example, that's already a terawatt, right? One joule divided by 10 to the minus 12 seconds is 10 to the 12 plus 12 watts, and that is one terawatt of power. And if you squeeze it further to 100 femtoseconds, per seconds, you can have 10, you squeeze it to 10 femtoseconds, per seconds, you have 100 terawatt. So all you have done, you have taken the same visible light, you have probably the same energy, but you're shrinking the duration of the light paths to shorter and shorter uh, values. And as you shrink them, the peak power, the, you know, only for the duration of that burst, if you take the energy and divide it by the per burst duration, that is what is known as a peak power, and the peak power uh, approaches enormous values like terawatts and petawatts and 10 petawatt and whatnot. So um, it's a very nice way of producing high power light by just squeezing light in time. And of course, you can also squeeze it in space. You take a pulse like this and focus it with a focusing optic and to something like 10 microns or so, and then you can generate your squeezed it in time, you squeeze it in space, and you produce extremely high intensity. So this revolution has happened in the mid 80s. Uh, you know, after the lasers were invented in 60, the first laser itself was a pulse laser, millisecond duration Ruby laser. And uh, that was probably maybe kilowatt, sub kilowatt, whatever power it was, I don't remember. But then in the 80s, then quickly people started making Q switching, mode locking. Then they started producing nanosecond, um, you know, pulses, picosecond pulses too. Uh, but the power levels remained around, if you see this top graph on the right hand side, so it's about gigawatt, a few tens of gigawatt, maybe 100 gigawatt, you know, in big amplifiers and so on. But then in the 80s, there was a revolution called the chirp pulse amplification revolution, CPA revolution, and that pushed the factors by a factor, by a powers by a factor of 1000. And after that, we've been just marching on onwards on this upper scale around the turn of the millennium. Uh, we already had one petawatt pulses and the one petawatt focused down to uh, micron scales or tens of micron scales already gave you intensities which are 10 to the 21 watts per centimeter square. So this is um, now, you know, we were talking about Avogadro number and I'll show you another Avogadro number where we sort of like an Avogadro number, but these powers have just made us go higher and higher in intensity uh, as time progressed in 2020, 2020, 20 years after this graph was made, we now have a 10 petawatt laser, which is a 20 femtosecond laser in Romania at the extreme light infrastructure. Um, so this is just about a year old, a year and a few months, and they're getting it ready for experiments. So this is 10 petawatt, look at that. So I wanted to highlight that. 10 petawatt is 10 to the 16 watts. One petawatt is 10 to the 15, or 10 petawatt is 10 to the 16. 
and uh, when you uh, so this our own little example of hyper lasers uh, this is the tfr 150 terawatt laser it was 100 terawatt upgraded recently to 150 terawatt 25 frames per second pulses at 5 hertz what you see are uh, parts of the laser this is a big amplifier that you see at the bottom the final amplifier pumped by lots of green light to produce population inversion and producing that orangish yellow glow and a part of this orangish yellow glow is what is amplified uh, you know and as the 800 nanometer uh, high peak power light so pretty much i think you also have a tie sapphire laser at isp so high energy density science you know what it means to uh, live at these high intensities and expose matter to them and what happens and why does it happen that way and um, in view of the shortage of time some of it is self imposed limit that i have i will just illustrate this science with just one example right and so let's see i'll give you some tutorial so that you can at least get the basic ideas of the field and then uh, you know one example just to see how exciting the science is so there's several reviews that you can read and uh, so this is the team over the years um well i i don't know if this probably a later picture than when rishad was with us riju was with us long ago uh, Reggie Philip was with us, so we have had lots of contribution from uh, Kochi and Kusat. So we are very grateful for all that work that they have done uh, with us. So these are collaborators from across the world, uh, IPR and IIT Delhi, very important collaborators, simulation people, Zhengming Sheng, and uh, theory plus simulation people from the UK. So um, most of us learn in school optics and also undergraduate optics too that uh, optical interactions basically everything light comes at you know visible light is what we normally worry about 10 to the 14 10 to the 15 hertz light frequency um, comes and gently taps this electron and the electron then shakes a little there's an in dipole moment that's induced and that dipole moment radiates the light so you can call it as Rayleigh scattering sometimes there are state changes so raman scattering uh, fluorescence, whatever it is, can be explained just by this what is called induced dipole irradiation in the so called linear regime. That is, the dipole moment is actually proportional to the electric field, uh, you know, corrected by the polarizability or susceptibility of uh, the matter of the atom. And usually we think it's only the balanced electrons. Nobody talks of a casual electron being disturbed by uh, an optical frequency light at low intensity. Uh, but we have known, again, ever since the laser was invented, that this doesn't work when you go to high intensities. And intense, particularly the, when you go to very high intensities, you now start competing with the electric field of the light, competes or overwhelms the electric field inside matter. So this is the hydrogen atom 1s electron. This is a standard measure of the intensity scale. And so the scale that is used is the hydrogen atom 1s electron intensity. So 10 to the 9 volts per centimeter. 10 to the 16 watts per centimeter square, and the current highest record is 10 to the 23. So 10 to the 23 is 10 million times larger than 10 to the 16. 10 to the 16 is called Coulombic intensity because there's a Coulombic electric field. And so we are now 10 million times larger than the Coulombic intensity. And 10 to the 23 is our famous Avogadro number, right? 6.023 into 10 to the 23. So now you have an Avogadro number kind of intensities that we have right in the lab. And this was produced this year, uh, last year, uh, 2021. So it's a world record. So seven times larger. So tell me, if I ask you, if you were face to face with me, and I look at you and say, look, should the Coulomb field matter at all when the light has such a strong electric field? And I'm sure your answer would have been, no, it should matter. Because now you look at, you're talking about three orders of magnitude larger than uh, the Coulombic electric field. So obviously, light should listen to the, I mean, electron should listen to the light more than it listens to the nuclear electric, uh, nuclear attraction. Indeed, that's what happens. So you have this uh, bound atom, you know, one dimensional bound atom minus Q by X. So the electron is sitting somewhere in this uh, potential. But when you apply this um, light wave, the light wave is an oscillating electric field at the cycle frequency. So if you have 10 to the 15 Hertz, uh, light then you know it's completing one cycle in one femtosecond so half a femtosecond it goes up and half a femtosecond it goes down and when it does that it actually adds the potential to the bound potential distorts the potential severely 
Now a distorted barrier gives an opportunity for the electron, which is earlier bound, to actually tunnel out. And tunnel out means that you can ionize the atom irrespective of what your photon frequency is, irrespective of what your light, whether it's infrared light, uh, whether it is, uh, you know, like say one micron light, 1.5 micron light, two micron light, whatever you have. If you have large enough in electric field, you can tunnel ionize these electrons. And this is what immediately happens when you go above 10 to the 16 watts per centimeter square. Not only that, though the light very quickly ionizes this electron and the light field is still there, the pulse is still present, then it starts oscillating this electron. Uh, if it's a linearly polarized electric field in the plane of the paper up and down, so the electron keeps going up and down. And how far does it go? Of course, as you know, the oscillation is proportional to the driver uh, amplitude. So uh, with an intense pulse, a very, very strong electric field, you can drive the electron something like 10 to 100 nanometers away from its uh, equilibrium position, which is, if you compare it to the Bohr atom, it is hundreds and thousands of times larger than the Bohr radius. So the electron, which was nicely sitting on the length scale of something like angstroms, now starts traveling as long as 1,000 angstroms. And 1,000 angstroms, if you look at it in a solid, is many, many hundreds of lattice spacings, maybe 1,000 lattice spacings. So it just takes an ex excursion all over the place in the neighborhood. It goes far away, right? travels far, and then comes back, goes the other way, it keeps swinging. And while it swings, it does several interesting things. So how much energy does it have? So this is an expression for the so-called kinetic energy or the oscillation energy of the electron. It's called the ponderomotive energy in technical terms. And that is, you know, at uh, one micron NDI laser wavelength at 10 to the 19 watts per centimeter square, it is 1 million electron volts. So you have a 1.5 EV photon flux, lots of very high flux, which pushes the electron, ionizes the electron, and then pushes the electron to a million electron volts oscillation energy, right? And uh, the accelerations are monstrous, 10 to the 17 times gravity. The particle is obviously relativistic. And relativistic means that you know, it experiences mass changes and so on. So this expression may have to be modified with the gamma factor. But the question is that you're coupling huge amount of energy to um, the electron taking it away from its rest position inside and then uh, grabbing you know, everything that is there um, and just making it jump a very, very high amplitude. So uh, for the students, it might be very interesting to look at this. So uh, 10 to the zero EV particle ionizes an atom with maybe 10 times larger or 20 times larger than the uh, photon energy, that kind of ionization energy. And then having plucked out the electron gives so much of energy, so much of energy to the, uh, to the electron uh, in the oscillation, which is much, much larger than both the above scales, both the photon energy and the ionization energy. So this is a very unusual regime of interaction, not encountered in any other situation. And if you keep on shooting intensities higher and higher, so you have uh, 10 to the 13, 14, you have barely one electron volt or 10 electron volt oscillation energy becomes KEV at the Coulombic intensity at one micron, of course, uh, for India laser wavelength. At 10 to the 18, the rest mass energy is crossed. And that's what we call the relativistic uh, intensity threshold. And above that, you can keep on going. You can go to 10 to the 24, then protons start becoming relativistic. So imagine shaking a proton um, to speeds of you know, light, <laughs> all with uh, one EV photon flux. That's really uh, spectacular. So as I said, if this happens in a solid, you have, you have a solid here, the plus and electron, electrons are red here, and let's bring a light pulse, it comes and hits it here, and ionizes and excurs, you know, sends the electrons on an excursion. As they go past in the neighborhood, they knock out more electrons, and they create, give energy to the entire neighborhood, and they heat it up. So now you have 10 to the 23 per cc free electrons at 10 to 100 EV. In normal conditions, as the energy is given, you would have seen the solid expand into a liquid or, a so or even a gas. But if you go with a femtosecond pulse, this doesn't happen. You see that I've not changed the lattice a little bit at all. I've just made the central portion redder and redder. Why? 
So that's a good question to ask. And uh, the beauty is that, you know, this, th that question will be answered in a short while, why this happens. And, but meanwhile, let me just tell you that this actually produces, it heats up the plasma, it, it heats up the solid, produces a plasma. And then from this plasma, you can now produce beams of electrons, which are at 10 to the 21 electrons per cc density, right? 10 to the 21 particles per cc at KeV to MeV energies. So I will tell you how this happens, but I thought that I should flag this as one of the major uh, events that occurs in this interaction. The reason, the way these pulses form is given below. So if you have taken even any laser, you know, the, on the rising edge, you can actually ionize the solid. You can produce a plasma, a little bit of plasma. And the, all these experiments are done in vacuum. So the plasma starts expanding towards the vacuum, right? The solid and the vacuum. So you have a solid here and you have the vacuum on the left-hand side of this uh, vertical line. And so as it expands, it forms a, some sort of an exponential, some sort of a, you know, decaying layer in terms of density. So now if you launch a second pulse uh, or the rest of the pulse, laser pulse itself, as it penetrates, it goes only up to a density, which is called the critical density. And the critical density is where the local plasma frequency, the, the local density is such that the light frequency matches what is called the plasma frequency. And the plasma frequency is the frequency of the corrective oscillation of the electrons in this plasma. So you have a region which is called the critical layer here, you have an underdense region, and you have an overdense region where the densities are larger than uh, the corresponding frequency to the plasma frequency. So light comes here, and if you have a pre-plasma, it actually goes and stops at this critical layer. So it's something like a wall inside the plasma. Then you would wonder how does the light excite uh, the rest of the solid? You mean the light cannot excite the rest of the solid behind the critical layer? Uh, no, actually some very interesting things happen at the critical layer. At the critical layer, for example, if you have this process where you set in, you can set in oscillations of groups of these electrons or a collective motion of the electrons. If you have what is called this process called resonance absorption, where you have this p-polarized light, uh, which is incident at an oblique angle. And then you have a plasma gradient, you know, perpendicular to this solid here. And then you have an electric field, which is which has got a component. This p-polarized electric field uh, has a component along the normal. And this normal can now start making this plasma jump up and down or back and forth across this. And that's what is the plasma oscillation. I've been talking about omega p, the plasma frequency, plasma oscillation frequency. This is exactly the plasma oscillation, which is well known in plasma physics, right? So these red are the ions, blue are the electrons, and you can see that there's collective motion. The electrons everywhere are moving across their nearest neighboring ion. And the motion is sort of coherent motion that's happening here. And when these waves build up to a very large amplitude, they cannot be sustained anymore, and they actually break. And when they break, they transfer energy to the rest of the, the, the energy is dumped in the plasma. And this generates a specific group of electrons called the fast electrons, which can have energies all the way till relativistic uh, you know, energies, meaning that the electron velocities can start approaching the speed of light. So if you look at it, how does this laser plasma interaction happen? So you have ionization plus absorption at the rising edge. Then you have uh, this collective process which happens in the rest of the pulse. And at the end of it, so you have the moment I told you that you know, light comes, stops at the critical layer, but then creates these waves, which launch these very fast electrons into the plasma. So the area behind the critical layer can start getting excited and the energy is conveyed deep into the target. So it's a sort of a relay race between the light and the electrons. And uh, this is how the, the flow chart for the entire interaction, ionization of the valence electrons by light, then acceleration by the same light pulse, uh, which leads to then collisional absorption or collective absorption. At the end of everything, you have this thick, hot soup, uh, which is the high energy density plasma. I asked you this question, I told you this, that you know that if you go with the femtosecond laser, the ions are, I showed them as if they were at their original locations. Why did I show that? The answer is given here. We are preferentially heating the electrons to millions of Kelvin, we are heating electrons only preferentially because they are the light particles and they are the ones that respond to the light at the frequencies of 10 to the 14, 10 to the 15 Hertz. 
the ions are at least 2000 times heavier their resonant frequencies are their oscillation frequencies are much higher uh, much uh, sort of lower their time the time that they take is much higher so they remain essentially frozen look at this this is the time scale of the laser on the left hand side and then the electrons are of course they jump up and down because they're light particles right like a young person can jump up and down but as you go on in life your your oscillation amplitude goes down and you think a lot before you move around so pretty much like uh, what ions do here so the ions take a long time hundreds of femtoseconds maybe picoseconds sometimes tens of picoseconds if the ion is very very heavy and bound very strongly so if that is the case then um, you have essentially done all your work you have created a preferentially hot system of electrons for the duration of the laser pulse eventually the electrons will share the energy with the environment you know they radiate out they can transfer energy to the ions and so on and so forth but for the duration of the light pulse of tens of femtoseconds the ions are essentially frozen and the density is the same as that of a solid but the temperature is now much much higher so this is a recurrent theme in femtosecond intense laser matter interactions and this is what is to be kept while looking at any phenomenon so uh, matter gets fully ionized in this um, intense light fields uh, large charge densities highly energetic electrons typical systems uh, you know parameters found only inside sun and stars uh, very rapidly violently kicked system every physical parameter that you see here is abnormally large say billions of gauss magnetic fields i'll show some of that and pressures of gigabars and so on electrons are relativistic ions can get very high energies and start hitting each other and if you have ions of the appropriate uh, you know if the temperature is high enough they can fuse and produce fusion energy and whatnot so lots of every kind of physics can happen in this little you know microscopic plasma so um, this is a picture of everything, many things in the universe, including some man-made like inertial confinement, fusion, magnetic fusion reactor, uh, neon sign, and so on. On the left-hand side, on the vertical axis, you have temperature, which is written up to 10 to the 8 Kelvin, 100 million Kelvin. On at the bottom, you have densities going up to 10 to the 30 particles per meter cube and so on. You can see planetary cores, high densities, not so high temperatures, Jupiter, but uh, the sun, very high density, 10 to the 26, 20 to 10 to the 30, and temperatures of 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 Kelvin. So in one sense, I mean, you know, you can access many of these things in a laser induced plasma experiment. And that's the beauty of it. And this ICF, inertial confinement fusion, is something that we hope will produce carbon free energy for the earth and save this earth from uh, disasters soon in the next uh, decade or couple of decades. So if you come to the lab, uh, our lab, for example, we have a solid target mounted in a vacuum chamber and we heat it with this something larger than 10 to the 18 watts per centimeter square. And that uh, then creates this explosive situation, creates this high energy density plasma, which then spews out relativistic electrons, uh, radiation all the way to gamma rays by Grimstrahlen emission, and also on uh, soft photons like terahertz and even you know lower than that and it also can produce protons by various mechanisms ions by uh, various mechanisms so on but it one of the interesting things for us is that it produces these electrons which are shown in green here they travel like a jet into the target after the waves break so there's a directional emission of these electrons and these pulses can have electron current densities as large as a trillion amperes per centimeter square. So I, I say that again, a trillion, that is a million, million amperes per centimeter square, something that you don't experience anywhere else, right? It's only here. And these things are again femtosecond pulses. Many of these emissions are femtosecond pulses. So everything happens extremely rapidly in this situation. Well, your driver has been is femtosecond, so everything should happen rapidly. But as an experimenter, it's a high challenge. Uh, it's an extreme challenge for us to measure things selectively because of the hot environment, lots of electromagnetic noise. It's a very violent, very rapidly changing environment. And you need to be very careful in what you're doing, um, you know, how you're interpreting data and so on. So over the years, we have done a number of things. 
And uh, so several things, for example, we have looked at almost all aspects of the physics here. We have looked at the shocks that have been launched by the laser pulse. We have looked at uh, you know, absorption processes whereby we enhance the fast electron emission because the fast electrons are good for hard X-ray emission. So you can make a very bright hard X-ray source using on a tabletop using this kind of a laser. We have accelerated all, all sorts of particles. We made um, unusual back, you know, X-ray sources, as I said, and even terahertz sources. But today I have time just to illustrate one of these. And I'll just focus on the electron transport inside and the giant magnetic field that it actually contain, uh, drives. So let's begin. These hot electrons are fast electrons. They take away a large amount of energy, roughly about 40%, and they form these big ampere current pulses, giving rise to current densities, which are 10 to the 12 amperes per centimeter square. So do these exist is a question that has been asked a long time ago. And people have taken what is called a shadow graph of these electrons. They take a snapshot picture in this experiment, which is a classic, uh, 1999. Uh, they irradiated with uh, a very powerful laser, and they came 1.2 picoseconds after the laser pulse and took a snapshot. And you can see there's a semi-isotropic cloud which is expanding here, but then there are these jets. And there's a lake scale here, 400 microns, and there's a time scale here, 1.2 picosecond. You divide the length scale by the time, you see that this is 0 0.6, 0 0.7 times the speed of light. So relativistic electrons are actually launched inside as jets. And the thing is, this is one, one simple snapshot. But if you want to see this evolution continuously, how do you see this? The, you need to have a measurement device or a measurement scheme where you actually see things happening on femtosecond and picosecond time scales. And that's what something that we have done. So see things as they happen on femtosecond time scales and where they happen. So across the entire surface of the plasma, so on micron time, on micron spatial scales. So we do this standard pump probe experiment. I'm sure lots of it is being done at ISP. Uh, and we take a pump which comes and causes the plasma. Then there are time delayed, frequency modulate, frequency modified probe that comes, hits this plasma. And then from the reflection, you can figure out the Doppler, you know, from the motion of the plasma, you can uh, look at the polarization and thereby infer the magnetic fields. You can measure density changes if you put this into an interferometer. You can do whatever you want, right? It's a very powerful technique and something that we have benefited a lot from. So we measure the fast electron current by simply measuring its magnetic field, right? How do you measure the magnetic field? Is by using what is called the Faraday rotation or the cotton morton effect, which is broadly known as polarimetry. And so we do an experiment like this. We bring in a pump beam on a target. We bring in a probe beam. Uh, we uh, divide the pump into, uh, we divide the laser into a pump and probe. The probe is converted to second harmonic and both of them impinge at a certain time in a certain time scale that we decide for every laser pulse. So every laser pulse here is an experiment and every laser pulse is split into a pump and a probe, right? And the target is moved to a fresh spot for every single laser shot. So if you take 100 uh, laser shots, the target will have 100 pits wherever the laser has hit it. So this is what we um, amusingly call a hit and run experiment, uh, but luckily it's a safe hit and run uh, case. Nobody bothers us for doing this. So um, lots of details are in this paper in 2014 that we wrote. So please look at that. Today I'll just present the results saying that um, around the time Riju was with us um, in 2000, I think, and Reggie was also with us around that time. We found this in this experiment we actually measured 25, 30 mega gauss magnetic pulses, magnetic field varying very rapidly on time scales of five picoseconds or so, five to 10 picoseconds uh, with 25 to 30 mega gauss. And uh, over the years, we have now gone to very high intensity. So we can now see a nearly 100 mega gauss pulses with similar durations. And not only that, uh, and the physics is understood by very simple, you have this expression for the growth and you know, the time evolution of the magnetic field. What happens inside the target? This expression conveys the physics here. So you have a laser that comes and hits. This launches these fast electrons. And the fast electrons build up an electric field inside this solid. And the electric field then starts pulling out electrons from the neighborhood or from the solid environment. So in the metal, it's very easy to imagine. You have this so-called free electrons which responds to the smallest electric field that you can create at the head of this bunch. So you have return current, you have a fast current, 
you have a return current and the return current tries to nullify the fast current and when it is totally nullified and so on you have this magnetic field which decays uh, and dies down so this is the source term which is a j hot hot electron current term and this is a diffusion term here connected by sigma which is the conductivity of the medium the actual medium which is hot and dense here right so we also looked at the spatial variation of these fields and the spatial variation of the magnetic field goes like this. It's very interesting. Um, it has all sorts of inhomogeneous spotted, you know, some, some kind of a mountain ridge kind of behavior. It is not uniform at all. It is spiky. It is, it appears totally random at different, different time scales. But if you, so this is something known as filamentation where the electron beams actually break up. The original beam that you launch from the critical surface breaks up into small, small filaments by what is known as the Weibel interaction or, or the physics is conveyed in this slide. So you have initially this blue current and red current are, so for example, the blue is the forward current of this hot electrons or fast electrons. Return current is that of the thermal electrons inside the environment there, neighborhood. Initially, both of them emerged. Uh, but uh, because of some fluctuation in the plasma, they can actually separate. So there are multiple kind, you know, different kind of electromagnetic forces here. So an electron bomb like this actually tries to pinch itself by self-attraction, but opposing currents actually repel each other. So this electromagnetic interaction actually serves to break up this repulsion between the forward and return currents, breaks up the uh, electron beam into small, small filaments, and that is what localizes the, uh, that was causes the localized magnetic field, which is the reason for that spotty magnetic field uh, behavior that we saw. So uh, this is a filamentation, which I think we were happy to produce evidence for that in our experiments. And then we went uh, a little more, we said this, you know, this um, kind of random kind of uh, magnetic field pattern that we get, what does it mean? Does it have more physics? So we took a Fourier transform of this in space. That is, we have an X scale here. There's a time scale and there's a transverse profile. So we took a Fourier transform in the in space. That is, we went to the KK space. And this is, so we converted this to a, electro, a magnetic field energy density uh, power spectrum. So and this is what we see. They look all random in space, but in the K space, they all have this beautiful uh, power law behavior in terms of the magnetic field energy falls with the increasing k space or decreasing spatial length in this fashion, which is a power law. And this is typical of what is called a turbulent spectrum. So we actually have seen that the magnetic field becomes turbulent. And uh, this turbulence is pretty much like what you see inside the sun. The sun has a magnetic field, which causes all sorts of problems for us on the earth. Uh, you know, sometimes the phenomena actually jam the earth's communications and whatnot when it sprays out, you know, there's sunspot activity, ejections, coronal mass ejections happening, magnetic reconnection, all sorts of things are happening in the sun. And so, but this can be seen in our experiment in the lab. And uh, this, of course, has been observed in great detail by satellite observations, uh, you know, over the years, over the last 20, 25 years. Uh, so solar flares have been studied, they show similar behavior. Solar photosphere shows similar behavior. And so we produced uh, this in the lab and we wrote this paper uh, saying that you can actually see astrophysical scenarios right in the lab. Hello. Yeah. So um, then uh, let me quickly go to say that, you know, like we have, uh, I've just given you one example of this, but the story is very, very interesting. Uh, intense laser field excitation of matter is really intensely exciting or super intensely exciting. And you can produce extreme conditions, uh, high temperatures and high densities. And ultrafast dynamics, of course, is something that you need to know because things are evolving so fast. And if you do such an experiment, you can call yourself an all, all physicist. You know, you're not just a condensed matter, plasma, uh, whatever physicist you are, but you're actually uh, a much, much broader physicist than you can ever imagine to be. You can be anything, nuclear, condensed matter, particle, anything you want. So uh, to conclude rather hurriedly, I'm sorry about this. We are at Mumbai, but we're opening a new campus. We have opened a new campus where from 150 terawatt in Mumbai, we'll be going to a petawatt laser in um, Hyderabad in the next couple of years. And so that's Bombay, 
that's hyderabad for you and we'll be doing lots of interesting things with this and uh, i hope i have conveyed you a little bit of the excitement that we are doing and so we welcome students we welcome collaborators from our old old uh, friends in kusat um, so please come and join and thank you very much for your uh, attention so we had a very interesting and lucid lecture by professor ravindra kumar on uh, high intensity laser plasmas uh, he has uh, succinctly explained the exotic things which happens in the target and uh, this is a field where tremendous scope exists for further investigations and i think uh, students in isp should really get excited about uh, what he was speaking about now i think if uh, there are questions uh, i think we can go ahead with a few questions Did you maybe it was too I, fast I, 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 maybe <laughs> I just uh, just a quick question because uh, i know you have to leave um, when when hyderabad campus comes up is it uh, going to be something like ral or can we make it something like ral so that you can Did you directly funds for projects? And... No, actually, we would we would make it at least a you know welcoming facility. I don't know eventual shape, but it will be a facility where collaborations will be very very welcome. Because I think the full power of the laser um, can be used only by lots of universities joining it. I mean, certainly, Kusat is one place yeah. uh, where you have lots of expertise, and I think it should join by way of you know sending students across with definite experiments. So the PIs can come. Uh, Hyderabad University is just next door, so that is one place. So IIT Madras maybe. So we have identified specific groups, Kusat included, ISP included. So we will ask, we will see collaborations from uh, new people, not the other way around. <laughs> You're most uh, welcome, Vijay. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, Professor Girijavelan, there are a few questions in the Q and A box. Can I read it for you? Yeah. Uh, before that, uh, can I ask uh, one question to Professor Ravindra Kumar? It's not a question. It's a doubt. So you are the chair, sir. Uh, yeah. Well, and these uh, high electric field uh, intensities, is there any distinction between uh, free electrons and the bound electrons in the target? They they should all behave the same. Yeah. Actually, that's a very good question. So you know, I mean, if you you will pluck out valence electrons from many atoms in the periodic table, right? you can also do multiple ionization by the light field itself but once it happens once you release a few electrons by this violent ionization that happens they can do subsequent ionization by cascades and so on as you know very well so you can pluck out electrons from the k shell um, if not i mean you don't do it by light but you can do it by light induced this electrons which are moving at you know half mev hundreds of kev and so on they will go and knock out electrons from k shell l shell and that's how you can actually get k x rays k and x rays uh, and l x rays from this uh, plasmas well i, I think uh, dr riju has been uh, examining the x rays coming out of uh, the yes, uh, yes. inner core ionization <laughs> of atoms yeah yeah so riju is riju is a partner in crime he has been in the field for long <laughs> yes. yeah chapter these x rays at tfr okay please read out yeah, the yeah, question Come on, right? Don't have. Yeah, uh, we have a question. Ah, uh, uh, Ravi, I will read it for you. Can we manipulate yeah. the hot electron waves in the material created by this high power laser? Yeah, in fact, uh, there are ways. You know, hot electron waves mean the plasma waves. You are saying. So people are, you know, depending on the regime of excitation, you can actually do. You can. There are various things that happen. Sometimes these waves don't look like waves to you. because for a wave you need to have a certain density scale uh, there's a length of region over which the density should vary and so on but you can even break a wave before it is fully formed you know what i'm going to tell you d let's change the world a u x mode um okay so i think yeah there are but you can send me i'll send you a more detailed mail maybe uh, please send me that question by email 
Okay, Devi. Uh, I will ask the person to contact you through email. Yeah, even so, the other question, since there's been a phone call and I have to go, I'm really okay, sorry okay. about this. Yeah, we will send um, it. But um, please do send questions by email and I'll be happy to answer. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Giran, sir, over to you. Giran, sir, over to you. Hello? Uh, Pro Girijan, sir, can, can you take over? Sir, you are muted, sir. You are muted. Girijan, sir, you are muted. Please unmute. Oh, okay. I think I am okay now. Yeah. Well, uh, I take this opportunity to thank uh, Professor Ravindra Kumar for his excellent speech on this uh, National Science Day. Uh, we are all interested in uh, this kind of uh, activities from possibly from 90s onwards uh, or even before. So yeah. I find a lot of interest uh, from ISP participants in this speech. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vindra Kumar, once again for taking time to give this National Science Day lecture uh, in this conference arranged by ISP. I, I now hand over to Dr. Pramod. Okay. Yeah. So um, I'll just take a minute to say thank you very much, uh, Professor Balaban, Girija Balaban, and uh, well, Pramod, uh, Riju, and all friends for having me here. And apologies once again for rushing through, um, but uh, we should continue the dialogue in some other form or email or some other sessions. Thanks a lot. Definitely, Vivi. Thank you. Thank you for being part of our conversation.